yesterday there was uh, one question, which is like, we use, we are discussing a lot about different methods, especially like on how to increase uh, participation, eventually also for direct democracy. But in many cases, we face one problem, which is the problem of scale. Like, how can we bring this eventually to very big scale, like big cities or even like country size scale? And so today I will discuss about this and especially from the framework of collective intelligence and also mostly from modeling and agent based models. So um, you, you will see mostly like from, uh, let's say, a more theoretical point of view. And um, yes, so I would start by actually I can use this one how to discuss like how do we usually solve problems which are a very big scale and the way you, we do it is that of course usually citizens do not solve the problems directly you know like we have to build a new road or i don't know a new power plant we don't have that the citizens decide exactly what to build and how to build it but we usually have representatives which work with the experts and they are actually the ones which are crafting the solutions. Solutions which then are implemented on the lives of citizens. In some cases, citizens might have more or less something to say about this. Most cases and mostly in the form of yes, no vote. Uh, but some way like their input is very, very limited on many of the choices that then will impact their own lives. And as mentioned, there have been many different methods which are trying to explore how we can have citizens actually, uh, we saw for example uh, today participatory budgeting, how can citizens some way come directly and craft their own solutions or at least having way more to say on actually what they would like to see around them. And as mentioned, this works well as small size, but we don't know uh, at least to now, we had a lot of problems in scaling it up to bigger size. And this has a lot to do with what is called the cost of coordination. And it's pretty much like the time or energy spent in discussing, because of course, if you want to have 10 people on board, you want to have a discussion with all these 10 people. But as you can see, like the time starts increasing more and more, and when you start reaching 100, 1,000 people, it start getting progressively more and more challenging to have a discussion. Also because you don't just want people to express their opinions, but they need also to be able to react to other people's opinions and ideas, and so comment. And we know conflict exists, so eventually this time might even increase more and more. So actually, I think I have more slides, I don't think it's the, the right one, but I can just skip it, okay. Um, so if you want to take this from a framework of um, complexity science, we mostly want to focus on cases where we have that the sum of the parts of the systems actually is bigger than the whole. But in some cases, if the system is not well designed, somewhere we might have the opposite effect. And we have that actually adding more people to the system some way subtracts to the power of the system. Some way like having more and more parts just make the system more messy and less powerful. Well, we want to design a system which is smart in its construction, in the way the parts interact. And this is actually what is generating the, the overall smartness of the system. So is just direct dialogue the only way. We definitely know, know that this is not the case because we know plenty of cases in which people can find coordination between big groups of people. For example, we might have coordinators which facilitates this role, but some way now we are going a little backwards and we're coming back to where we started from where, because we said like, in general, we would like to give more power to the people, but then we say like, we want coordinators, so we are a little going backwards. And if you look at many of the solutions that have been found or the methods that are usually implemented, they usually need to compromise, and this is normal because you will never have a perfect solution, but they usually need to compromise on one of these points. 
So either they directly start with a small group, just because maybe the group is itself small or because there is small participation, maybe you can have just a few percentage of the involved people are going to participate, or you can have subsampling. Also, you can have, as mentioned, like you can have coordinators or representatives, or you can also have some algorithms which are going to filter. So maybe like you can have like a very long input on what is your idea, but then you can have someone or an algorithm which tries to boil down to a very single idea. And finally, there are cases in which you have limited input. So for example, when we vote, usually we have just yes, no. This is a case of very limited input. Or again, you might have that you can express your idea, but in very simple words. You cannot really articulate your full idea. You just need to provide a very simple and concise uh, description of what you have in mind. So now if... Um, I want to show you something which is very powerful. <laughs> so the, the power of the internet, as mentioned, like I'm missing a couple of slides, I think, but, uh, and I'm not sure if the video, I think you have the, the other version, but anyway, never mind. I'm trying to see, okay, I'm sh just showing part of the video. And then I will just skip, but, okay. So, <laughs> you don't need to see the entire video. More? <laughs> we will play the, the full video later. But this is the power of the internet, video of cats. So, so uh, what actually I wanted to, to discuss about this is that uh, actually there is another way of actually crafting solutions with big number of people. And uh, this um, has been, I'm just, skipping on this one okay so this has been called remixings in uh, remixing in the literature on tiktok is called chains but actually it was known way before and is also connected with what is called peer production so you don't have like some centralized um area in which like things are produced but everyone some way can produce and contribute to the produ production of something in this case would be like the production or video of music. But I want to really show you a little bit of like how this video is created because it's really showing how you can go in many different directions and every person can actually bring their own creativity and inspiration. Because what we had at the very beginning was that one person posted online just a video of a cat. And this was the final product for this person. But then someone else actually was inspired or had an idea about this product and wanted to make something else. So it added like some recording with his instrument. And then more and more people get on board and then he produces like a song with 16 different people. And uh, what is interesting is also the style of the song is changing actually along the way. So you have a lot of advantages from this method because it's completely horizontal, is voluntary, is motivated. And one of the main advantages, and this is why I was very interested in this, is that it's completely asynchronous, which means that with many other methods, what you have is that everyone needs to participate at the same time. So if we want to need to have a discussion between one group, we need all to be free at the same time. But with this method, actually people can participate even if they're not able to come at the same moment. So one person might work on Sunday, another person might work on, um, on Wednesday morning, for example. And this has the potential of scaling really well because you do not need to interact with all the other participants, but what you're interacting with is just the artifact, what people have produced before you. So let's say if a video has been produced by 1,000 people and I want to join, I don't need to interact with all the 1,000 people and say like, I want to participate to your video, uh, explain my motivation, et cetera, and then find an agreement with 1,000 people. But I can directly take the video and modify it to the way I like it. 
So of course, this is like just videos on TikTok or like peer production. Actually, there are other ways uh, you might be familiar, for example, with GitHub, which also works a lot in this direction. But we want to see if we can have something like this, which actually will work for direct democracies. And there are some key differences because like many other formats, some way have like form of uh, uh, main branch. For example, on GitHub, you can always integrate the work of other people. But here you don't want that someone has the original idea and then it says like, okay, I like your idea. It would be integrated. No, I don't like your idea. It will not be integrated because then this would be that you control the overall uh, evolution of the ideas. And similarly, we have that at the end, in many cases, we need one idea which works for everyone. Because in some cases, we have things like laws which needs to be applied to everyone. For example, if we are working on a law on gun control, we cannot have it that it will be applied on me, but not on some other people. Well, we can have something like this, for example, for operating system. Everyone can use different operating system, but for laws and other things, these are global goods, and so they will be applied to everyone. So the basic idea of the process we're looking into is that there is going to be some platform and one person is going to post an idea, for example, let's build a park or whatever they would like to work on. And then like people would be able to modify, but also without rewriting what it has been done before. And this is important because at certain points, some people might want to go back to the original idea and then start forking from that original idea. And as you can see, this allows like a very quick exploration of the solution space. And everyone can bring their own idea and they can go in many different directions. Okay, all of this is quite interesting, but can we show that it can work in some way? And as mentioned, I'm working, can I quickly open the other, no, I cannot open the other presentation. Anyway, um, what I'm using is mostly agent-based modeling for exploring this. And agent-based modeling is very interesting because it's a way of representing a model and then running the simulations, which allows you to link the interactions, how the agents interact, to the production of some macroscopic effect. But if someone has, working, has worked with ABM, you know that actually this is not completely true, but we also have to add a series of other assumptions. For example, we, we will force our system to work synchronously. Maybe we update the state of our system in a specific way, or we have a specific distribution of opinions or whatever. We have to make a lot of choices, which also might affect our conclusion. So what I'm doing is that I'm using three different models. I'm not going to all of them, but what I'm doing is I'm using three different models, which all start from the same assumption. So they start to model, they try to model the same approach of like people using this remixing for direct democracy. And I'm going to show that it works. And every method actually is going to be from a very different angle, is going to make very different assumptions. And especially the two kids and kids are two approaches from ABM. They're one the opposite of the other because one is trying to keep the model as simple as possible. And the other is trying to keep it as descriptive and as realistic as possible. I'm not going to tell you what is the final S. Maybe this is like an Easter egg for... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, and by the way, I'm going to show to explain just the first two, the analytical and the KISS approach, uh, because the other one is, uh, is too complex and we don't have time. So in the analytical model, I'm just simplifying, oversimplifying the system and I'm trying to see exactly how things can scale when we consider the different types of interaction. And in particular, I'm interested in, can I have my, okay. I'm interested in 
how much time people will spend in looking for a solution or eventually listening to other people in the process and what I'm defining a search area, which is like how much of the solution space they're able to search. And in general, the main idea in this part of the model is that the more they can search, the better solution they can find. We will confirm this with the agent-based models. So both methods, just like having a discussion between people and remixing, they scale with n, when n is the number of people, which means the more people we have, the better ideas we can generate in both cases. But as mentioned before, there is one big problem, which is unfortunately, when you're having a discussion, also the time spent in discussing increases with the number of people. Here I'm being generous and I'm using just a linear increase. We, just by experience, we know this might go actually pretty, um, can go much, uh, can increase much harder. In remixing, on the contrary, we have that the time spent in searching for a new solution is actually fixed because you don't have to interact with everyone in the system. It's just determined on how much time you spend in looking for a new solution. However, there is a big uh, problem which I haven't discussed yet, and is the fact that we do not just need to generate new idea, we also need to decide which idea is going to be implemented. And so if we take this into the system, we have that if you ask everyone then to rate every design which has been produced, then also remixing start having like a much, um, start increasing in time with the number of participants. Because if we say that 1000 participants are going to produce 1000 designs, it means that every person has to rate or to evaluate 1,000 different designs. So some way, the time spent in the, in the process at the end increases linearly with the number of people also for remixing. But as I will explain a little better in the ABM, uh, there is one way to actually keep it limited, and is if you ask people to review just a limited amount of designs. And then you can use this information to actually decide which design is going to be, sorry, which solutions is going to be implemented. So eventually what you can do is find a compromise. So not like people were not going to review every possible design that we're going to review just a small subset. And this is going to be kind of a pre-filter for telling you which, des which um, solutions are the best. Sorry, sometimes I'm using the term design in uh, some context is used design for solution, but it's just the same thing. So the simple agent-based model is actually a little clearer what is going on and is based on four basic parts, which are the agents, which just represents the people in the system, the solution space, and in this space, every coordinate is going to be a different solution. So um, every point is just a different solution. You also have proximity, but this is not too important. And every agent has a utility function, which is defined on the solution space. This just means that if we take a solution and we give it to an agent, the agent is able to tell us how much he likes this solution. And it might be have some. Uh, it might have some solutions which likes better and solutions which likes worse. And this solution space actually is going to be different for every agent. So we're not supposed that everyone likes the same things in the same way. But you can have that every agent might like different things. And last but not least, the least we have the platform. So this might look like it's redundant because we already have the solution space, but in the platform, we will put the solutions which have been actually discovered by agents. So agents will be able to explore the solution space, but they won't know all the possible solutions. It's just like if you have a discussion and you are like brainstorming, you will not be able to know immediately like all the possible solutions to a problem. You need to go and discover them one by one, and then you have to put them on a side so you can re retrieve them. So the algorithm works in the following way. We have 
the platform in which we have the different solutions which have been discovered so far. And the agent, the agent just selects one of these solutions randomly. After this, what happens is that the agent trying, tries exploring the solutions surrounding that solution. So if this was our solution, what the agent is doing is going to explore these neighboring solutions here. And what you can see here is the evaluation of these solutions. So this agent likes the original solution 0.2. This would be the utility function. And you can see like how much all the neighboring ones are liked by the agent. So if the agent finds a solution which is more interesting to the agent itself, so it's not more interesting in general, just for the agent, then the agent is going to add this new solution to the, to the platform. So this is a little like how TikTok works. Like you have an idea, you make the new video, you just post the new video because it's funny to you. And we repeat this process multiple times. And on average, I'm making such a way that every agent produces five solutions on average. Some might produce more, some might produce less. And I'm just choosing five because it's a reasonable number. And then we have voting. So until when we reach this step, we close the phase in which people can produce new idea and we start voting. And as mentioned, we have two sub steps in voting. Initially, every person or every agent rates random, 10 random solutions. So everyone is assigned with 10 random solutions. Eventually, this could be improved in later stage, but here we wanted to do something very simple. And also, like if you use something like a recommender system, it introduces a lot of problems because eventually you can find some hacks to the recommender system. But so I'm keeping it very simple just for this. But everyone ra uh, raised 10 random solutions, and then the 10 which have been rated the best are selected. And then everyone is going to rate this one. So they're going to vote on this 10. And I'm doing this in which everyone votes this once because if you're approving something, I don't know, like at national level, you want that everyone should have the possibility of voting on what is passing. You don't want to approve something because it was voted by 1% of the population, for example. Another thing which I want to stress, and this was kind of implicit, was that every agent some way is self-interested. So I didn't put in the system the fact that people might be interesting, interested in the wealth or the well-being of other people. This is not because I think that everyone is selfish, but because I'm trying to have a system, I'm trying to explore some way like the worst case scenario. And to see that if this works also in the worst case scenario, then we might have something like, you know, the invisible hand where everyone, even if everyone is doing their own uh, personal interest, at the end, you still ha can have something which works pretty well for everyone. So how does this work? This is from the... Um, uh, analytical system, and this is just a representation of the fact that the time spent in the discussion is increasing in the debate case while it's bounded in remixing. But what is more interesting is actually the average utility of the solution that uh, agents find. So this is every point here is obtained by repeating the same uh, simulations 50 times every time uh, initializing randomly. And what we're plotting is how good is the solution which at the end was selected by using like all the steps and having the vote. So at the end, they select one solution and we can calculate how happy are all the agents by just calculating the average utility they got from this solution. What is interesting is that if we plot this against the number of people, we have that if we increase the number of people, we also have that they are able to find better solutions. This might sound eventually trivial from the system, but actually it's in stark uh, contrast with what we have from other systems in which the more people we have, the, uh, the lower the computational power goes. And 
another thing which is interesting is what happens if we explore diversity. And here diversity is just defined as how diverse is the utility function. So for diversity zero, everyone would uh, like exactly the same thing. Everyone would have exactly the same utility function. While for diversity one, everyone would have completely uncorrelated utility function compared to the others. You have, I'm sorry, like this is not the final figure, but anyway. <laughs> so you have to look at the green curve and this shows us that actually the utility can grow depending on the diversity. And in general, you have that as you increase diversity, unfortunately, you have that also your best compromise go down because of course you cannot have a solution which makes everyone happy because if everyone likes different things, even your best comparison is not go your best compromise is not going to be as good as you might hope. But in any case, if you take the ratio between the green, sorry, the blue and the green, you have that is still going up, which means that the more diversity we have, the better the agents are able to explore and find better solutions um, overall, which make everyone happy. A quick note, this might be a little um, quick generalization, but if you have central systems, actually they should have a curve which is closer to the blue curve. So they would have like an incentive to, or they will have their maximum for zero diversity. And again, here I'm generalizing a lot, but this is for example, what you can see with uh, like some parties which try eventually to get as their, um, their voters are as homogeneous as possible. So I'm going to conclude now, but the main takeaway, it was just like, I was going to explore if we can have a system which actually could work with very big number of participants and which participants can actually contribute as much as they like. And the, what we see from these simulations, again, we have multiple types of simulation, is that the method seems to work and also it seems to be improved by the number of people and by their diversity. And this seems to work also in the case in which everyone is self-interested. So some way the fact that I just try to search what is the best solution for me, at the end still produces solutions which are better for everyone. Not because there is some magic, but because we are in a system. And so at the end, everyone is searching from different solutions. And so this provides much more diversity of solutions at the end. And uh, yes, like definitely there is much more to explore, uh, but um, yes, these are next steps. And this is like still a very um, stylized approach for exploring this, but definitely we need to get more depth into the system. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.